After this opening, we are now apertura, uh, adesso, diving into what's a data society, what's the impact of data in society, so numbers, information, but also people, because when we talk about a society, we cannot but talk about people, how we live in the society, how we navigate the challenges of the society, how we keep institutions accountable, but how, also how do we keep ourselves accountable. Uh, it might seem blurry now, but uh, I'm confident that our next speaker, Sam Lee from the World Bank, is going to enlighten you. Welcome, Sam. Benvenuto, Sam. So, hi everyone, and thank you, Antonella, for that uh, generous introduction. Uh, my name is Sam Lee. I work at the World Bank, and it's such an honor to be here today speaking to you. Uh, this is such a collection of do-gooders and innovators and in the historic city of Rome, and I'm so glad to be talking today to you about data society, its impact, and what it means to us. I also want to thank Personal Democracy Media and the Municipality of Rome and its specialized agencies for making this happen. This is an amazing, amazing venue, and I look forward to all the stimulating discussions that we have coming up today. Great. So, so just to give you a little bit of sense of where I'm coming from, sort of what data means to me and the lens in which I'm viewing the world. Uh, so I work, currently work at the World Bank right now, applying open data to both our corporate work and also applying transparency to our client countries so that they can better operationalize and use data to, to become more efficient, to use those things and to use data to provide better services services to their citizens and to do things that uh, also open things up to more transparency. I've also spent some time working in the private sector, uh, working with an Italian firm actually, looking at opportunities to enter emerging markets and especially with the development angle. And I've also worked policy for the government, especially around international policy, how to make the movement of people and things more efficient. And lastly, I've spent some time on the ground doing NGO work uh, for, for a medical assistance organization. So each of these different things provide, provides me with some background, a little bit of experience, and a way that I think about data and the way that I think about the world. So just to give you a brief outline of how uh, what we're going to cover today, one, I want to define what is a data society, what are the key points, what makes something a data society, how can we improve it. I then want to dive into what current impacts data is having on society. I, of course, there are tons of opportunities and tons of insights, but I focused on a few that you may not have heard of uh, from more from a global perspective. And of course, the challenges that arise as we use more data. And lastly, I wanted to talk about changing society and the world through data, because this is such an opportunity for us, one that I believe is untapped. There we go. So, first, what is a data society? Does anyone have any ideas? <coughs> Feel free. Anyone? Okay, move forward. So, I think. First of all, every four days, there is a one new Google. Now, 90% of the information in the world has been generated in the last two years. Now, that, is, that is an insane, insane statistic. Every two days, we have the information equivalent from the dawn of civilization to 2003. And every day, we are exposed to more information than someone in the 15th century was exposed to in their lifetime. So if volume is the measuring stick, we are indeed a, a data society. I mean, it, it is just an explosion of information that we have at our fingertips that the people have not had until this very point in our society. Now, of course, there are larger questions that this raises, including who are we more responsive to? You know? How are we going to be more efficient? For whom? I sometimes like to think of our current society and the way we want to use data for social good as applying a Fitbit to the world. So uh, I don't know if you guys like to quantify yourself, wear a fitness tracker, you can track steps and see, see what you've done for the day, but it really does help in, in measuring your goals, setting new goals, and measuring progress to them. But when we think about doing this on a global level, all these questions have to be answered. So who sets those goals? And how do we keep ourselves 
accountable. Just the point to say that you know all these new technologies and all the data that we have and the new techniques that we have, these are all neutral things. So you don't want to advocate for solutionism or internet centrism. Uh, anytime I see the words golden bullet, panacea, I think those are signs for you to stop reading because already you know that this is not going to be going to be a realistic solution or a realistic set of parameters that you're going to be uh, up against. And the potential impact of this is huge, right? So McKinsey estimates that $3 trillion will be generated through things like open data, with 1.7 trillion of that being generated outside of the US and Europe. Uh, it's in the US, we estimate that over 300 million jobs have been created through companies that rely on open data. And Cisco has claimed that 19 trillion will be generated through the Internet of Things. And of course, uh, when we think about data, it's hard not to also think about the Internet and what that means for society, and especially uh, the speed at which things can scale if there's data and also uh, some new technologies and techniques. So in addition to the volume, the economic opportunity is huge. I now want to shift into the second part where we talk about some of the early social impacts of, of data and what it's having on our society. So we look at things like Opower and Nest. Now, Opower is a, a company that provides software that allows corporations to use their energy a bit more efficiently. So, and Nest is also an in-home thermostat device that's connected to the Internet of Things, and I'm sure you all know this. But the impact of this is 5.1 billion kilowatts of hours saved, 7.8 pounds of CO2 were uh, displaced, and that's a savings of $564 million. Now, what makes this interesting is that data drives this, right? So we talk about data, we can also talk about advanced customer engagement. So we're using data to change human behavior. This is, data can also be used for inclusiveness. This is an example from Kenya and Malawi. It's an application called Go to Vote. Now what this does is it helps verify voter registration. Now I don't bring this app up to say that it's a, it's a great app, it's a beautiful app, but it's a great idea and great ideas scale. So basically a developer in Kenya created, created a mobile application that allows voters to check their registrations and provides more information about how they could vote. So as we use technology to, to make, uh, to make democracy and to make participation more, uh, more inclusive. Now, what made this very interesting is that this same application was scaled in Malawi. And not only was it scaled, the government adopted it as its official tool. So, and this helped over 400,000 people uh, register in the March 2014 elections. Data also helps with knowledge and capacity building. And I wanted to raise this example of Tuva Labs, which is a software that uses data to increase data literacy. So this is used in schools, uh, by teachers and students to actually use data to increase the data capacity of those around us. In terms of advocacy and accountability, uh, two examples, there's a Moldova education tracker that takes education budget data and translates it to, to various aspects of the public so that they can better track the use of public funds. And an example called Nigeria Follow the Money. This is a CSO group in Nigeria. They, they create citizen-driven tools, maps, they, they translate material. And in this case, there was a campaign against lead poisoning and they were able to allocate 5.4 billion dollars to fight that. And this is an organization that a lot of times if you feed data to, they can make they can make it useful and they can take it to the constituents who would find it useful and in the ways that they would want to see it and can understand it. So service and market creation. I think this is one of the most uh, surprising and kind of fun, entertaining parts of data. You don't know what people are going to do with data. Uh, this is an example called Light Raider. It's a, it's a running app that was developed in the UK. Now, the UK government, of course, has been really, really proactive about releasing data, responding to citizen demand, but there are some things that you just cannot anticipate. And in this case, uh, this, this group of developers, they, they thought that there was a health problem in their city and they decided to take street lamp data. So the, so the UK government released data about the location of street lamps in its cities, and this team created a running app that, that incentivizes and gamifies 
uh, running routes based on, on the street lamps. And so these are things that we didn't even anticipate. It's a new service. It's, a, it's the market expanding. And so always keeping an eye on this type of activity is, is helpful. And finally, an Italian example, and I use the previous examples not to say that there aren't Italian examples, of course there are plenty, um, but one of the most traditional uses of data, especially open data, has been for transparency, communications, and CSR. Now, Beni Confiscati, I know many of you are familiar with this site and this operation. Um, one of the things that I really like about this is that it scrapes and reuses public data. So it basically says, you know, I don't, I don't care what data is being provided to me, I don't care what format it's in. I find it useful, I want to structure it, I want to take it. So it's citizens taking, taking charge of data, taking charge of their own interests and taking charge of their own expertise to make, to make data more structured in their terms and on, uh, against their objectives. Uh, just a brief thing, so the reason I collected all those examples was through a crowdsourced experiment, and if you go to the link bit.ly dot open database, and that's case sensitive, we're collecting open data on open data. So there are many times when, you know, like I mentioned earlier with the, the Kenya app and the Malawi app and e even um, most of those uses, these are things that can be applied in different settings. Now, there isn't an opportunity to, to scale it directly. There is also this sort of fetish around, oh, I want to take this app. If I have this code, then I can reuse it here. It very rarely does it work that way. But great ideas, they scale and they can be adapted and they can have impact in meaningful ways beyond their initial scope and use. So uh, it would be great to actually add more uses, and this is available uh, for everyone. So if you're looking for new ideas, if you want to add your idea, just please go to the link and, and add it here. So just now that we've talked about the promise of data, just briefly wanted to touch on the dark side, and I'm sure others will, will touch on these points that are far more qualified to do so today, but privacy matters, security matters. Uh, these are things that there are far too many examples in our current world where, where the wrong things are happening, uh, but these are just good for us to be aware of and to also counteract. Additionally, the hype. So all those examples that I provided to you before, you know, these show us a little bit of the promise, but at a global scale, we're not seeing this happen everywhere and we're not seeing all these positive benefits trickling down in all those different areas. So security, privacy and also countering the hype cycle. This is sort of the dark side of data because data makes things possible, it makes things real, but it also provides some pitfalls and challenges along the way. This is a quote, a tweet from a good friend, a civic hacker who named Friedrich, who, who lives in Berlin, and there is something about data that makes us want to measure things, that makes us want to create frameworks, that, that makes us want to effect, uh, me measure, effect, impact. And, you know, doing, doing with data is very difficult, right? So I love this. One of the beauties of open data is that the people evaluating whether it works have three times the budget of those trying to make it work. And this has always stuck with me because, you know, everyone in this room probably has tried something and has had it fail. Everyone has probably released uh, some data, has worked on creating a tool or a platform. And initially, and once in a while, you can, the things just fall flat. And in those situations, it's important to kind of take that not as the end, but also to use that as an opportunity to collect data and to move forward. But especially around transparency work, I, I feel like there is this dynamic where we're setting the frameworks and creating the tools almost trumps actually doing the good work. Because data is messy, data is difficult. And those of you who are in, in the arena with this, I know you know how it feels to to actually make this work and to do so on, on resource-constrained environments. So we're now asked to be doing more with less, ironically, through data. I wanted to also talk about an unlevel data society. So we talk about the impact of data and how it can change our lives, it can change our societies, our municipalities, and also our countries. But there are some aspects of it that I, that I believe make it an unlevel playing field. So if you can imagine a game of football uh, where the pitch is, is sort of elevated, I guess that would be advantageous for one side, right? So it really helps if you're actually on the side that benefits from, let's say, the increased data, increased techniques and technologies. But what about the folks on the other side? Or what if you're not playing the game at all? 
So a couple statistics. In 2014, globally, three in five people are offline. Now, this, this boggles my mind because I think we come from places where everyone is connected. In the city of Milan, for example, right, where I've heard that there is almost 100 percent of connectivity in the city. But three in five people globally are offline. And this is according to the Internet Telecommunications Union. In Europe, also, uh, in 2014, one in four don't use the Internet. And as much as we're a connected society, as much as we're a data society, there is a gap. And in the U.S., one in five adults don't use the Internet at home, work, or school. So when we think about creating the tools that uh, allow for participatory government, we allow for crowdsourcing, we allow for citizen feedback, there, there is a good chunk that is automatically not eligible or not interested, perhaps, in, in participating because of the technology gap and because, that they, because of their... their uh, disconnected status. Now, when you visualize this, and this is from the Oxford Internet Institute, uh, you can see how differently and distorted the world looks when we just look at connectivity, right? So we see countries that appear larger because of their digital footprint and countries that look smaller. And in fact, when you look at some regions like Africa, I mean, it almost doesn't exist relative to the size of Europe. So these are considerations to think about uh, when we think about data, when we think about society, and also how we go about making the world a better place through the new tools and through the new techniques at our disposal. So, a few things about bridging the data divide. We want to increase accessibility, right? So, we want to take things to people in the way that they want to see it. We want to truly understand and respond to demand. A lot of times, we ne don't necessarily want to understand demand. We just want to roll through a solution or roll through uh, what we think will work and what we think will benefit those we're serving. But I think it's, it's good to actually understand and respond to demand with the new tools and techniques as well, rather than just applying them to our stakeholders and constituents. And the third is to, to go local. So we want to take this to, uh, the, to, take it to the ground, basically. Uh, and a lot of things start uh, nationally, but as we see things happen in more municipal settings and even beyond that at a subnational level, that this is where true impact happens. And it's not about, it's not about sort of the, the larger thing that spurs it, but it's really the impact that it has on the ground. And of course, when it comes to bridging the digital divide, I think it's important to support a lot of these new efforts around extending connectivity around the world, uh, and even in disaster situations where this is being applied. So that includes internet.org from Facebook, Google Loon, a project called Olivis, and also a project called OuterNet. So as we continue the rest of the day, there are three data principles that I wanted to share. Uh, one, and this is something that I'm extremely passionate about, and I think everyone in this room is passionate about, open by default. When we make things open in the design phase, in the implementation, and in the evaluation, it can only benefit the uh, it can only help us achieve the end objectives of what we wanted to, or what we initially set out to do. I don't have to preach to this audience because I know you guys all feel this. To be data driven. So I touched on this earlier, but not just to use data as a tool for helping uh, people see things in a new way, compelling them into action, but actually applying that data to ourselves. A lot of times, I think this can be a, such a double edged sword because if we use data to evaluate our own progress, uh, not only does it give us an opportunity to pivot and move things in a more efficient way, it could also tell us that what we're doing is completely irrelevant. It could tell us that what we're doing is not having the impact at anywhere near the scale that we need to be having it. But to be data-driven at all costs and in all aspects of our implementation, I think is key. And thirdly, to be human-centric. So a lot of times we focus on data and we start to just see these metrics, or I want to collect this information and I want to apply this algorithm and I want to throw it into this system. But at the end of the day, if that data doesn't have a human component, if it wasn't driven by a human need and it doesn't address a human need, then that data, especially for social good, is not meeting its potential and we're not meeting our potential. So, 
This is an image of the Hyperloop, which is a tube that allows people to transport very quickly. Apparently, you can go from New York to San Francisco in, uh, I believe, 30 minutes, and New York to Beijing in, I think, three hours. But this was a, a design by Elon Musk and the Hyperloop Corporation. And I share this because this was released to the physics community. They looked at it and they said, you know what, this makes sense. This could actually happen. It involves a tube and a vacuum. Uh, uh, but I mean, it really boggles the mind, right? So schematically, it makes sense. The map makes sense. So we know where to start. We know where we want to go. And I think data provides us that as well. So it helps us to see where we currently are. And data as a map allows us to then plot out where it is we actually want to go. So I think we all see what data can do. We all see what data can't do. And we all more or less are starting to develop a new and revise a new plan and goal for where we want data to take us. So, 80 kilometers. My geography is not that great. Um, so, where is 80 kilometers from Rome? Where, where could 80 kilometers get us? Anyone? To the beach? Yeah. <laughs> it's probably closer. But 80 kilometers, you know, it's not, it's not a lot, right? It may have seemed like it was a lot at one point in time, but 80 kilometers is pretty, pretty doable, I would say, in, uh, less than a day. If you're, I guess if you're on a bike, you could even do it if you're a hardcore cyclist. But what direction are we moving in, right? So 80 kilometers in a car, in a train, in a bus, you know, you can take us a certain direction. But what if we want to move up? All of a sudden, that changes things, right? Um, 80 kilometers up. Now, there's some debate as to what exactly lies, uh, where space lies, right? But conventional wisdom say that it's about 80 to 100 kilometers above the Earth's atmosphere. Now, that changes things, doesn't it? If all of a sudden we say, hey, we're going 80 kilometers, but we're actually going up. Now, the, as we continue to make this journey, so uh, we now know where it is we have to go because this is difficult, andare. this is not easy. Uh, you really have to fight and push and make sure that things are happening in the way that you want them to happen. But as we make that journey, meter by meter, kilometer by kilometer, and as we go up into, into space really, because that's what we want to do, right? We want to make this impossible, this impossible journey that seems much more doable now and also within our grasp of, of measurement. We want to do that together. So as we go through the rest of the day and the rest of the debates and the, and the presentations and the panels, let's just think about 80 kilometers. And I hope as we dream about these, these new dreams and these new visions, I hope that we can actually make progress into achieving them together. Thank you.